all you cool cats and kittens. Jason here from Radio, and today's webinar is going to be all about why you should calibrate your display. Uh, we've talked a lot over the years about how to do it. We've even done some webinars where I've done some live streaming, you know, calibrating a JVC projector last week, calibrating some TVs and those live streams. But one topic that I wanted to really touch on is why you should calibrate. Um, you know, we can talk about the how all we want, but how do we uh, how do we uh, give the value proposition? How do we uh, teach this uh, to the customers and, and, and why they should be doing it. A lot of installers will uh, do calibration as sort of a, a upgrade, if you will. Uh, some installers will do calibration uh, included in a system that they built and installed for that, for that particular client. So a few different tips and tricks on how to sell the service, some, some good speaking points, some good examples of what to show your customers, questions to ask your customers. And I really just wanted to cover the whys of ISF calibration in this, in this webinar today. Again, my name is Jason. I'm with uh, Radio and AV Pro Global. Um, I do have a question box open for this webinar, so if you guys do have any questions throughout the presentation, feel free to type those in the question box. I am flying solo, so if you uh, if you have a pressing question that can't wait till the end, uh, feel free to use the little hand raise icon. Uh, if you guys uh, hit that button, I'll see that on the screen here, and I can answer that question right away. Uh, but feel free to answer, uh, ask questions as you like, and uh, I'll leave some time at the end, too, for some questions uh, if you have any uh, towards the end that we didn't come during the presentation. So. Uh, what we're going to talk about today is uh, who is the Imaging Science Foundation, uh, where do they come from, why, why have you maybe seen that uh, icon or logo on some products. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about how our eyes work. Um, you know, we're all humans here, so we need to learn a little bit about how our eyes work and how we see things. What actually makes a good picture? Uh, we've got four specific things we look for when judging picture quality, and we'll cover those at length here today. Uh, what equipment is required for you to calibrate? Uh, there's uh, specific things that you need, light meters, signal generators, some software. Us, we'll cover the ins and outs of that as well today, too. And really, what's in it for me? As an integrator, why should you be calibrating? As a customer, why would you want your TV calibrated? A lot of this is around awareness, guys. So if you have a showroom uh, and, and you have the um, you have a couple of displays in the showroom or whatnot, calibrate one of them, calibrate two of them. When you have customers in the store, uh, give a demo, calibrated, not calibrated. Uh, again, I'll give you plenty of tips here today. To, uh, to set demos up and to uh, set expectations and questions to ask your customers. A little bit about me, I'm Jason. I've been with the company now for a few years. I've been calibrating for a little over 12, uh, actually 13 now. Wow. Um, if you guys have any uh, questions for me specifically, I'll leave my information at the end of the webinar, my email address and whatnot. But uh, this is really where my heart is uh, as far as this business goes. I, I, love, I love this part of it. I love making pictures look good. I love tweaking things and uh, kind of uh, satisfies my OCD a little bit. I've spent uh, this last weekend with a JVC projector in the house. I've never had a projector before. I actually lived with one before, so I've kind of had it over the past couple of days. Uh, if you guys have any specific uh, pieces of content that you're really into, any really cool movies you've seen lately, I'm always chasing good content. So I usually, uh, during these webinars, I usually mention some of the movies I've been looking at lately and uh, what to look for in those movies and whatnot. If you guys have any tips or any movies that you've seen lately, uh, feel free to share that. I'm always, always, always looking for some good content. So who and what is the ISF? Uh, the ISF is the Imaging Science Foundation. Uh, the company has been around since the mid-90s. Uh, picture you see there's uh, me and Joel Silver. Joel Silver is the founder of the ISF. Uh, he came from the publishing world uh, doing TV reviews and whatnot. Uh, there was a magazine back in those days called Perfect Vision. Joel was doing some writing and doing some reviews for the magazine. And as he was reviewing different televisions, he noticed that they all looked different. So that led him down the path of doing some research and trying to figure out, okay, so what should the picture look like? What is it supposed to look like? And started reading up and found some documents, and it turns out that this stuff is all standardized. You know, what white should be in a movie, what green should be in a movie, what black level should be in a movie, and things like that. So his idea was to take those known standards throughout the industry and apply those to a customer's TV at the home. And really, at the end of the day, what's, what's the benefit of that? And I'll go over some of those things with you today. So the ISF uh, represents standards, really just a standards organization. Um, we, uh, we work directly with TV manufacturers to help them with their menus and to help them with their picture controls. Uh, we work with a lot of manufacturers when it comes to sources and uh, test equipment and all kinds of different things. So a lot of times you'll see that ISF logo, maybe on a display or on, on a tool or something like that. Really, we got to see that ISF logo. That just means that, that uh, if it's a display, at least, that means that that display has all the controls needed to calibrate and should calibrate relatively well, if not uh, really, really well. In a lot of cases, we've seen some uh, recent ISF certified that calibrate perfectly. So, you can see that ISF. 
ISF logo just means that that product has been through uh, some vetting and uh, it's had some experts' eyes on it uh, many, many times, <clears throat> and we've made sure that that product uh, can be calibrated, has all the settings that you need. And in some cases, guys, you can lock the TV. So if you go through and spend two or three hours calibrating a TV, the last thing you want is for that customer to accidentally reset that picture mode. So in a lot of cases, you can uh, you can lock the um, calibrated settings, and if the customer wants to play with another mode, that's totally fine. So uh, yeah, as you guys see that ISF logo, one thing I do want to just kind of debunk, which I've seen over the years many times, people see the ISF logo in the TV and they assume that the TV's you know, pre-calibrated or calibrated from the factory. Just be careful with that, guys. That, that does not mean that it's been calibrated from the factory. That's impossible to do. Um, you know, the, the TV's never going to come perfectly calibrated from the factory. They just, they just can't do that. So if you do see that logo, that means that the, the TV can be calibrated and in some cases can be locked. Uh, the ISF's been working with companies like CTA, CD, and Focal for many years. Uh, Joel, uh, Matt Murray, and myself, uh, we're sitting on a, a, a uh, uh, we're sitting on a panel right now helping write some standards for uh, for some of these organizations. So uh, very, very deeply involved in the industry, uh, working with different manufacturers and different groups and integrators and whatnot. Uh, I think uh, since, the, since the early mid-90s, since the ISF has been around, uh, Joel's put something like 7,000 people through the program. So lots and lots of calibrators out there and uh, lots of products that we work with. I think we're up to 32 manufacturers, something like that, when it comes to the uh, ISF licensing. So what is image calibration? Uh, calibration, in general, in the general sense of things, is matching the um, matching a device uh, to a known standard. So in this case, we're talking about display. So um, in, in when we calibrate a display at home, we're looking at specific standards written by the ITU and written by you know, SIMD and all these other organizations. And, and again, like I mentioned before, we're applying those standards to a TV that's in somebody's home or to a projector that's in somebody's home. Uh, a lot of these days, guys, is really just balancing um, the knowledge of the display and uh, the science behind how our eyes work and how the display works. And there's a little bit of an art to it as well. Uh, if you guys have done some calibration work in the past, you know that sometimes you have to make compromises and judgment calls. And uh, you know there's there's certain times where uh, you have to make a decision. You know what's the lesser of two evils in this situation? Do I leave this color a little oversaturated? Or do I leave the grayscale a little blue? Or uh, so there's a little bit, um, a little bit of uh, experience that that you'll gain over time to uh, to really help you get through some of these uh, some of these uh, calibrations. Uh, what we really started to notice lately is, um, you know, a lot of TVs will have sometimes 50, 60, 70 different adjustments in the TV by the time you get really deep in some of the advanced menus. And you know, really at the end of the day, guys, we're talking 70 different um, adjustments on a TV. One or two of those adjustments doesn't mean the picture's going to be you know, majorly different or majorly better or anything like that. But if you take all 50, 60, 70 of those adjustments, even though some of them, some of them might be very minor, uh, you know, the, the total sum is is way, way, way more important than any individual part. So, um, you know, as you're doing this, just remember there are some major things that we'll concentrate on, uh, and there's some other things that sometimes you have to make compromises, uh, like I said before. But it's a little bit of a balance between art, science experience, judgment calls, and, and things like that, too. Uh, one thing I just always like to mention, too, professional video without calibration uh, is not professional. Uh, somebody comes in, they spend a ton of money on a nice projector or a nice display, they put it in a nice room, uh, you know, wall treatments and, and lighting treatments and these types of things. You know, the last piece of the puzzle here is to, is to calibrate the system, uh, regardless of the situation. So maybe it's a, a bright TV you know, on a beach house or downtown or something like that. And we need to we need to match that display to the room because again the manufacturers have no idea the room that the TV is going to go into. So that's that's our job as calibrators, and, and that's the job of the integrator. It, it's just like if you went to buy a suit, uh, you know, for for a wedding or something, you have to have that suit fitted to your body. You can't just buy a generic size off the shelf, right? So it's completely custom to that customer's system, that customer's room, where that customer sits. Um, and in most cases, you're going to want to have the customer involved to kind of get their eyeballs on the screen. When you're looking at certain test patterns versus the customer looking at those same test patterns, you know sometimes guys our eyes are a little bit different. Uh, if you have a customer that their vision's a little bit better than yours or worse than yours, you might see some different things in the test patterns. So getting the client involved is super cool, is super fun. A lot of clients, um, especially the ones who are a little more into this, they uh, they like to sit with you and, and look at the grass and stuff, and you kind of explain to them what's going on. And, and that to me is really a fun part of it. Some customers they say, hey, there's the TV, let me know when you're done, uh, and they'll leave the room and go. Go do some work or something like that, and that's okay too. Uh, in those kind of cases, you do want to at least have the customer involved a little bit because again, you might be looking at some certain test patterns, let's say brightness or contrast, uh, that you will want to have their eyeballs on as well. Just keep that in mind. 
So a few yeah, simple things for the customers to understand. Why why calibrate the TV? And I've seen uh, you know, I've seen it in a lot of cases before where the customer will say, why should I get my TV calibrated? And the salesperson or the installer will kind of go on this uh, you know long technical rant about standards and these types of things. And you know, you kind of look over at the customer and they have that glazed look over their eyes. So uh, without being overly technical and, and talking over their heads or whatnot, there are some really, really easy uh, examples I can come up with. We've come up with over the years to really determine uh, if this customer is right for calibration. So uh, one, one question we might ask is how well can you see the details uh, in the brightest and the darkest parts of the picture? So maybe your customer really likes to watch Game of Thrones or horror movies with, with, uh, that are really dark most of the time. You, know, you ask the customer, how well can you see details in the shadows when you watch a scary movie? And that's one benefit in calibration, right? Or point number one, see all the details in the brightest and darkest parts of the picture. Uh, the, the second question that uh, rings through a lot of people is uh, relates to skin tones. You know, as humans, uh, we're used to hearing the human voice. Uh, we're very sensitive to changes in people's voices. With our eyes, we're very sensitive in a similar way to skin tones. So we're all used to seeing skin tones. Uh, you know, if you turn on the news and somebody looks, you know, like an Oompa Loompa or overly sunburned or orange, uh, that can be a, a very big noticeable thing. Maybe their skin tone's kind of green, right? Uh, that can be a noticeable thing as well. So uh, one thing I like to ask my customers is, uh, you know, how, how do skin tones look? Do they look natural? Do people look sunburned? What do they look like? Because, again, another benefit of the calibration is uh, more natural skin tone. Another thing I like to ask the customers, too, is about the accuracy of the color. So maybe this customer is a sports fan, or maybe they work for a really famous company with a specific you know, logo or a specific color of a logo. Um, you know, maybe they have uh, pictures of their uh, vacation or something, and, and they're looking at a landscape scene or whatnot. So we talk about the, 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 the overall accuracy of the picture. This works really well with sports fans. If I'm wearing, uh, you know, next year, if I'm wearing a Tom Brady Buccaneers jersey, and I'm looking at it, you know, in person versus on the screen, they should be relatively close to each other. And this is the thing that we see a lot of times, especially in a maybe a sports bar situation where you have a zillion different TVs, a zillion different brands, and they're all in who knows what picture mode. So, you know, I'm doing kind of Tampa Bay Bucks jersey on one TV, it's one shade of red, it's another shade of red on another TV, maybe it's completely orange on another TV. Uh, so the accuracy of the color is a super important thing that we look for as well. The, uh, the clearest picture possible, what I mean by that is uh, very little to no distortion, uh, the picture being the right shape and the right size. These are things that we've seen all the time throughout the years. You walk into a, a, a home theater system or uh, just any video system for that matter, and it's in the wrong aspect ratio, so things are all stretched out, distorted, and look weird. We want to get around that. We want to have the clearest picture possible. And a lot of that, too, guys, also includes uh, getting the sharpness and some of the geometry settings set correctly on the projector. Some of those things are off or the sharpness is set too high. Uh, that can cause some unwanted artifacts in the picture. And like I said before on the previous page, uh, everything that we do when we talk about calibration is all about that specific room, that specific customer, and uh, that specific system. So totally, totally custom, which I like. Um, the other thing that's nice too is this, uh, if you do decide to offer this service as an integrator, uh, we also uh, notice lots of times over the years the calibrators will say that uh, it's uh, offering the service has helped them with recurring revenue. So um, you know, if you go and, and install a projector into somebody's system, and uh, you know, a year later, the uh, customer has used that projector quite a bit. It's ready for a new bulb. Um, when you go replace that bulb, you get uh, obviously you get to install the new bulb. You get the labor to put the bulb in. But if the projector gets a brand new bulb, um, that's going to change the way the picture looks. So there's going to be some touch up that needs to be done uh, calibration wise to that that projector now. So um, you know, you get some opportunities there for recurring revenue. And if you sell TVs and projectors, uh, we've also noticed over the years that. Um, Calibrated TVs very, very, very rarely get returned. Um, and, and if they do, it's usually for some defect or something like that. If the customer buys a nice TV, they're super stoked about it. An expert comes out to the house and calibrates it for them and, and shows them you know, the ins and outs and whys and looks at test patterns and gives them kind of a lesson on video. Uh, and then afterwards, the picture looks excellent. The customer can see all the details. The skin tones look good. Uh, the customer is super, super happy at this point, guys. Uh, and you're not going to have those situations where the customer calls and says, you know, I don't like the green on this TV, come get it. Or I don't like the motion on this TV, I'm going to return it. So if we give the customer some education, show them some test patterns, get them involved, um, they, the installers and in, 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 um, you know, retail type places rarely see those types of TVs get returned. So just a couple of things to keep in mind there. One other thing I'll touch on too is video wall calibration. Don't forget that in commercial. Uh, this can be super important. I've got a couple of pictures on the next couple of slides I'll show this off. but. Um, some things that I just noticed out in the wild a lot is inconsistently in, in the color of the video wall. 
or the luminance on the video wall. Uh, you know, one display of the six that make up the video wall might be way brighter than the others or way bluer than the others. You see that a lot. Um, inconsistency and inaccuracies and in screens and sports arenas. I've got a great example for that on the next slide. Uh, just different displays and different sports bars all looking different. I, I mentioned that before. There's one specific restaurant I'll leave nameless. Uh, I cannot even go in there and watch TV because you can tell every single TV is set to vivid and the restaurant's really dark. So as soon as, uh, you know, the grass comes up on a football game or something, uh, it blinds you. It's really, really bad. Uh, LED wall luminance. This is uh, one thing we talk about when it comes to comfort, but also think about safety. Um, there's, a, there's an airport that I visit frequently, and uh, every time I land at this specific airport, as I'm coming down the escalator to go to the baggage claim, uh, there's a LED video wall right there, and it's advertising the local beaches and whatnot. And guys, it is, it is no joke how bright that video wall is. Every time I go down that escalator, I've got to like, look down or close my eyes. And I can only imagine uh, maybe an older person or, or something like that, uh, you know, being maybe temporary, you know, kind of blinded for a second. And, and God forbid they, they have an accident or fall or something. So you talk about LED wall limits. It's not just about you know, making the picture look accurate and things like that, but it's also about comfort, comfort and, and honestly, a little bit of safety as well. Take a look at a couple of examples, just pictures I've taken over the years. This was at a, a hockey game uh, here local, and I, you know, I was sitting with a buddy of mine who came to the game with me, and I pointed this out to him, and we kind of made a joke of it because, you know, you know how this stuff is, guys. Once you point something out to somebody, they can never, like, unsee it, right? And this is one of those cases. So I nudged my buddy, and I'm like, hey, look at the color of the ice. Does it look normal to you? And he says, yeah, it looks white. What are you, what are you talking about? I said, okay, look up at the Jumbotron. How does it look up on the Jumbotron? And he looks at it for a second and he goes, oh my gosh, why is it so blue? Uh, now I can, now that's all I can see. So, um, you know, this is something that I've been dying to fix over the years. Uh, I've not gotten in contact with the right people to, to fix it, unfortunately. But uh, just by uh, readjusting the white balance on the screen, it would look a lot more consistent, a lot more uh, normal. Instead of that almost purplish white, we can back to normal white. Uh, this is a video wall at an airport. Uh, you notice these bottom two, um, you know, the, the center, and the bottom left screens, uh, if you notice the background, it's very, very blue compared to the more of a, you know, a neutral white or neutral gray that's in these other screens here. Uh, this is something that drives me batty. I see it uh, a lot of times on video walls. So nice for nice, clean, consistent installation, we'd want to calibrate um, all of these displays to all look the same. That way you get more consistency. Football with sports bars, this picture I've taken over the years, you can see down here, it's the same exact football game. Uh, the monitor on the left is most likely in some kind of vivid mode. You can see by the by the neon green kind of grass, the radioactive grass over here. Whereas on the display on the right, the grass actually didn't look all that bad. So, so what's probably happening here is they had this in some really bright mode. And they had this in some uh, more of a toned down mode. But uh, if, if I took a few minutes even and just at least set some basic levels on these two monitors, they would at least uh, look more consistent, look more realistic. I don't know what was going on over here. Uh, this was uh, obviously an extreme example, but these are things that I've seen out in the wild before. Um, I don't know if maybe there was even something wrong with this TV, but the, the TV on the right, again, same same baseball game here. The TV on the right, if you look really closely, it already was way too blue. Uh, you can see that in the skin tones here. This person has a blue, um, you know, almost kind of cast to his skin tone. Uh, and in person, it was even more obvious. The, the jersey was very blue, and that kind of thing. But don't, I mean, look at the example on the left. It's like 10 times worse. Um, so I don't know if this was in just some crazy out-of-the-box picture mode. Maybe somebody had messed with the settings manually, trying to make it better. Uh, whatever the case may have been. Um, in this case, both of them were very bad looking, but this uh, guy on the left here was, was even worse. And this is the only time I've seen this. I've seen this in other states and other cities and other sports bars before. So. Again, trying to get some consistency here, which you also might not be able to notice just from the pictures that uh, the one on the left was also way, way, way brighter. So even looking at it uh, was kind of painful. Uh, here we have a, um, this was a system I worked on for somebody who had a, a projector with a 110-inch uh, or 120-inch 235 screen. Uh, some of my favorite uh, systems to work on are some of these dedicated theater rooms. You get to see some nice big screens. Uh, what you're actually seeing right now I took three different pictures. Um, this is one of the opening screens to the first John Wick movie. So as the, uh, the trailers are over, the movie's about to start, you get the uh, get the different shots here of the different you know, production companies and whatnot that work on the movie. Uh, this was the, the Lionsgate or the Summit uh, splash screen. That's just up on the screen for a second, but it was very, very, very obvious to, to see this example. So this particular projector had several picture modes. 
I wanted to give an example of the brightest one out of the box, the most accurate one out of the box, and then um, actually calibrate it. So the screen of this uh, sort of splash screen here should be white, and that's what you see in the middle. After the calibration, the white screen was white. The brightest picture mode out of the box on this projector was a mode called Living Room. And it was much, much, much brighter, but look at what it did to the white background. It made it this kind of teal cyan color. So imagine what that does to the rest of the movie, right? If it's making just white, excuse me, just white, like this very teal color, the entire movie is going to look like that now. It's going to completely change the look of the movie. If we look at the very bottom, this was the most accurate picture mode out of the box. This was a THX mode, and you can see the whites were very green. So you can imagine what this might do to uh, anything, really. If I'm watching the news, this is going to give people green skin tones, everybody's going to look sick. If I'm watching hockey, the ice is going to look green. Um, if I'm watching the middle screen, that's where everything's going to look correct. So this is really what it's all about, guys. A lot of this has to do with how accurate the picture is, and just not making things look too green or too blue or too weird. So what is this all based off of? All of the things that we're going to talk about uh, with calibration is all based on how our eyes work. Uh, us humans, we have uh, some very, very powerful tools in our faces. Uh, for seeing and for surviving. Those are our eyeballs. Probably one of the reasons why we've become the dominant species on the planet. We've evolved and and, uh, and uh, we're, we're doing what we're doing. We have uh, some different uh, sensors in our eyes. Some, some of the sensors are used to pick up dark and bright information, and some of the sensors are used to pick up color information. So if you're driving down the road at night and uh, you're shining your headlights on a red wall and you turn your headlights off, all of a sudden, now that red wall is not red anymore. Why? Well, because there's no light to give us the red. So our eyes, as weird as this might sound, we actually see better in dark to bright than we do in color. And here's how you can kind of prove this to yourself. If I look out of a window on a dark night, I can see the outline of a tree, right? So if I'm walking outside, I can see the outline of a tree so I don't bump into it. But if the sun's out and it's daytime, I can still see the tree, of course, but now I can see what color the tree is. Why couldn't I tell the color of the tree at nighttime? Well, there's no light, right? Now, at the end of the day, what is color? It's a specific frequency of light. There's no light, there's no color. So our eyes are very, very, very well tuned for dark to bright. We use the sensors in our eyes called rods. So if you look at this blown up version of this uh, diagram here, we have rods and we have cones in our eyes. We have way more rods that helps us see the dark and bright information. The cones pick up the color information. So we have three types of cones, red, green, and blue. That might sound familiar to you. Some of the cones um, see, uh, sorry, the, all the cones see different colors, and there's more cones with certain colors than others. Our eyes are more sensitive to green because we have more green cones. Our eyes are more sensitive to the dark and the bright because we have more rods than we do cones. So everything that we do when we talk about how TVs make a picture and how we see pictures, it's all just based on biology and how our eyes work, that's it. So when you go to an eye exam, for example, at the optometrist, you know, the, the, the chart that you're reading is a white chart with black letters. Why? Because it's a lot easier to read that chart versus a chart that has a white background with, say, light blue or light yellow letters. It's all about the contrast. That's what our rods are responsible for. That's why we see contrast better than we see everything else. As you guys, I'm sure, know at this point, um, the way TV makes white uh, is by mixing red, green, and blue. Uh, if we take red, green, and blue, we can make virtually any combination of any color that we want to at any luminance level that we want to. So if we're looking at full blast white, uh, that means that red's cranked up all the way, blue's cranked up all the way, green's cranked up all the way, that's what's going to give us pure white. If we have the same amount of red, green, and blue, but at a darker level, we might have like a, a darker gray. If we have red, green, and blue the same amount, but all three of them are at a very, very, very low luminance. That's going to give us like a dark, dark, dark gray, almost black. So everything that we do is based off of red, green, and blue. That's how our eyes work. That's, of course, how the TVs are going to work. So if you really take a, a magnifying glass or a microscope and you're going to put up a plain white screen on your TV or computer monitor or your cell phone even, you'll see a sub-pixel structure kind of like this. When we see pixels on a TV or on a display, that pixel was actually made up of three sub-pixels, again, red, green, and blue. Uh, so I took this picture with a magnifying glass or a, or a little microscope, rather. Uh, cool little tool. You can buy them on Amazon. They're about 15 bucks or so. Uh, but these are good. Uh, I show this in class and show this stuff to customers a lot, and, and people get a kick out of that. But when you zoom in really, really far down, that's all you see, guys, is red, green, and blue. So the TV has to make that combination of red, green, and blue for each pixel 
That's what gives us a picture at the end of the day. So this was interesting. Uh, last year, year before, whenever that last season of Game of Thrones came out, you guys may remember this. Uh, there was a, uh, a giant uh, controversy around that one episode. I think it was season, uh, it was definitely season eight. It was the last season. I think it was episode five. Uh, the episode was a very dark scene. Uh, it was a battle scene at nighttime. It was meant to be dark. It was meant to be scary. Uh, the problem is, is that most people were watching it on a TV with factory settings or a TV in a bright room. Uh, they were also streaming, so that uh, causes a lot of compression artifacts and things like that. But I remember the next day after that episode, you know, everybody was talking about Game of Thrones uh, while that season was going on. And the big controversy was how dark it was. People were saying it was way too dark, they couldn't see anything. And meanwhile, myself and other people whose monitors aren't calibrated, uh, we could see all the shadows and we could see all the bad guys just fine. So this was actually kind of a blessing in disguise for us, I think, because it made people start to kind of realize that, um, you know, the settings on your TV make a huge difference. And, you know, as integrators and calibrators, when we get that, that's, that's no-brainer stuff to us. We have to think about the average Joe. You know, the average Joe, they buy a TV, they plug it in, they turn it on, and they assume that's just what the picture's supposed to look like. Uh, it takes an expert or, or somebody to come in and teach the customer um, about picture quality and what they should be seeing, what they should not be seeing, and adjust the levels on that TV for that room that it's in. So uh, this, the show itself looked fine. I mean, it had a lot of compression artifacts and stuff because of streaming and things like that, but I'm really anxious actually to see this one on disc. So um, you know, one of these days I'll, I'll get that season eight on disc and I'll take a look at that episode again to see how much better it looks on disc. But again, guys, this was kind of a blessing in disguise and, and we've seen these things before too. Uh, if you guys remember, um, Tom Cruise was with, I think the director of Ghost Protocol or one of the movies he was in. And they did kind of a public service announcement on Twitter, and they were talking about how the motion smoothing on the on your TV at home ruins the look of the movie. And you know, hearing the filmmakers actually talk about this stuff, uh, the cinematographer for Game of Thrones did an interview with Wired magazine a couple of days after this episode aired, talked about how yeah, it was supposed to be dark, but your TV at home uh, probably had the wrong settings. So it is opening up the uh, general public to what we do and, and getting people more aware about about the service and and uh, really asking these questions about. Like I said before, how well can you see details? How do the skin tones look? Uh, this gets people to sort of open up their mind to uh, to, to this kind of service. So uh, when we're looking at a picture, what actually makes a good picture? When we look at a TV in a store or a studio or at home or whatnot, and, uh, and we say, wow, that's a really good picture. What does that mean? What are we looking for when we say that? What makes us say that? The number one thing that we look for when we're judging picture quality, number one, always, because the way our eyes work with the rods and cones, like I said before, is dynamic range. And the easiest way to describe dynamic range, the difference between the brightest and the darkest parts of the picture. The bigger the difference, the better. You know, there's a reason why people love plasma so much. There's a reason why people love OLED so much. You know, those contrast ratios when you get perfect black are awesome. Really, really good contrast. Our eyes love that stuff. Very natural looking picture. Lots of pop, uh, lots of good color, things like that. We have good dynamic range. Number two is color saturation. Uh, in the simplest way, you could say how colorful is the picture. You guys have probably seen a picture that's too colorful before. That's when you get the neon green grass and the sunburned skin tones and whatnot. And you've probably also seen a picture too that wasn't colorful enough. So uh, maybe it looked kind of washed out or undersaturated or kind of dull, uh, pale. I've heard people describe it like that before. So color saturation, very simply, is the amount of color. There's either too much, there's not enough, or there's the right amount of color. Number three, colorimetry. That's just a, a, a kind of a technical word, I guess you could say, for color accuracy. So when we looked at the example before of the hockey arena and the ice on the Jumbotron was almost purple, uh, that's a colorimetry problem. Uh, if I look at a, uh, you know, a, a Target logo on a commercial, it should be red and not orange. Um, you know, lots of different examples there that you can use. But colorimetry is all about the accuracy of the color. And then number four on the list is resolution. How much detail is in the picture? Is the picture noisy? Is it, is it overly sharpened and it causes distortion? Is it not sharp enough? It looks fuzzy or maybe out of focus. Resolution is all about those fine details. You guys know um, if you've taken a picture with your phone before, you take a picture, you zoom in a little bit, uh, the picture maybe isn't as clear as it used to be. So when we're setting up projectors and setting up uh, flat panel displays, you know, we really uh, pay very close attention to the geometry. Um, in projector situations, you know, using things like Keystone can ruin the resolution, so we want to avoid things like that. Uh, on a flat panel display or projector for that matter, if the sharpness is set too high, it causes all kinds of uh, fake edges and edge enhancement. And, and if there's noise in the picture anyway because it's streaming and you crank up the sharpness, 
the noise is just like putting a magnifying glass on the noise. It looks really, really bad. Um, so those are the four things that we're actually looking for. Uh, it doesn't sound like a lot, but you know, everything that we do in calibration revolves around these four things. So, uh, you know, keep these in your mind. And as you're watching maybe your TV at home or looking at a uh, 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 you know, projector at the cinema or something like that, you know, put these things in your mind in this order and it'll help you really start to understand what the picture's supposed to look like. So in the early days of ISF, we were just calibrating a few things because this is all the TVs had to offer, you know, brightness or black level, contrast, white level, color, tint, sharpness, uh, and white balance. Um, at least those top five adjustments that you see on the screen right now have been on the front panels of the TVs since I've been a kid. Uh, white balance was always a little more advanced. Uh, in the early days, you had to like get into the TV service menu and, you know, there's all kinds of terrible things that could happen in there if you push the wrong button or did something wrong. Uh, but this is all we did in those early days. The tools were very limited. The displays were very limited. You know, some displays didn't have white balance settings at all in the service menu or anywhere for that matter. Uh, older displays, if you're talking two TVs, a lot of these adjustments were actually mechanical. So, you know, you take the back off the TV and you're in there with a screwdriver adjusting potentiometers and whatnot. So uh, it used to be a lot more mechanical things involved. It used to take a lot longer uh, to do the calibration. So we take, uh, we take a look at uh, some of the things that we do during the calibration. Um, you know, just, we don't have to sit here and, and go through all of these one by one, but just to give you an idea of all the things that we do when we calibrate the display. So the first thing that we do is we select the best user mode that has the best color temperature and color gamut. And when I say best, I mean the most accurate. So if the TV has five or six different modes to pick from, uh, picture modes, then maybe one or two of those modes is going to be much closer to the target than the rest. I'd rather calibrate a mode that was already pretty close versus calibrating a mode that's way, way, way off. If, a, if you have a mode like Vivid that's way off target, you might not be able to even calibrate it down to what the target should be. So it's always best to start with a mode that is already closer to your targets. Uh, we want to go through, we want to turn off all the Energy Star stuff. Uh, these things severely limit the TV's light output. We've seen in a lot of cases, just by turning off Energy Star, Energy Savings, that you gain 50%, 75% more light just by turning those things off. Uh, some things you might turn back on after the fact, but things like Energy Star, ambient light sensors, um, things like that, those are those will really leave those off for the calibration and, and probably uh, off to watch the content as well. Uh, we're going to adjust the luminance of the display, how bright the display is. That could be a lamp mode and a projector. It could be uh, you know a backlight on an OLED or on an LCD OLED light on an OLED. Uh, we're going to calibrate black level, white level. We're going to calibrate something called Gamma, which is really a room correction tool. Um, if the room is bright, you can go with one gamma setting. If the room is dark, you can go with another gamma setting. Uh, and the gamma is really going to help us see dark things like shadows, regardless of the room lighting, bright, dark, whatever. The gamma control is going to help us. Color and tint, uh, those controls are still there. We don't actually touch them as much as we used to, but they are still there just in case you have some color decoding problems. Uh, we're going to get the bit mapping correct, and that usually involves the geometry, turning off the overscan, some of the things we mentioned before. Uh, at least a two-point grayscale adjustment. That's what most displays will have. Some displays will go even further than that. Do a ten-point or a multi-point or a twenty-point even white balance adjustment. Um, the nicer TVs these days, actually, even the some of the entry-level and mid-level TVs these days have something called um, color management. This was something that was in only high-end displays years ago. Now most displays have color management. The color management system allows you to adjust every parameter of every color. So if you're reading your graphs in your calibration software and red's too bright or undersaturated or maybe red's too orange, uh, you can go in the color management menu and adjust all those different aspects about red. Not only red, but all the other colors as well. So you potentially have 18 controls for six colors, and, and the color management system will allow you to dial all that in to be super accurate. Uh, and after the display stuff is done, then we'll go through and we'll look at the different components. Uh, we'll look at some of the video processing features. Uh, we'll make sure the output of the Blu-ray player is optimized. We'll make sure the output of the cable box is optimized. Sometimes there's an AVR in the mix. You have to check the AVR's output to make sure that's optimized for that system. So you can think of this guy as more than just like a display calibration or a TV calibration. Think of this too as like a system calibration. You're not just going to get, you're not just going to calibrate the TV and get out of there. Uh, you're going to calibrate the TV and check all the components as well. And give the customer maybe a little bit of lessons on or tips and tricks on how to make the room darker or sitting in the right position and things like that. We're also there to teach the car as well. So why is this important? A, we have to match the display to the source. If the source is outputting one resolution and doing things at some levels, maybe it's the source has a black level adjustment, white level adjustment, you know, the source itself has to be calibrated in a lot of cases. So we're going to match the display to the source. We're matching the system to the room. 
Again, room lighting makes a huge difference here with how the picture is going to look. So we have to match this to the room. We want to make sure we're getting the whole picture. None of the edges are chopped off and you're not missing anything. You want to make sure you're getting the right picture. So when you're watching Avatar, that's the correct blue and purple and stuff that the James Cameron and the cinematographers originally used. We want to make sure you're getting nothing but the picture. Uh, we don't want any more or any less. There's a lot of it's, uh, older movies where you'll see old Godzilla movies where you'll see the uh, the strings holding up the puppets if you don't turn the brightness up to the correct level or down to the correct level for that matter. You want to make sure that you're just getting what you're supposed to get. Uh, we're matching everything to a measured reference. Uh, we're going to use some tools to help us with this, but we know in a video system what white should be. So we're going to tune that TV and that video system to that white, things like that. Okay, we'll take a look at some of the basics things here first. Uh, this is a test pattern to adjust the contrast or the white level of the display. And what we're going to be looking for here are specific boxes. So in a perfect world, you know, in most cases, I would see all the boxes across the top row up to 254. I would see all the boxes in this row. I would see all the boxes in this row, all the boxes in the bottom row. The problem is if the contrast is set too high on the display, a lot of these boxes will disappear. We call that clipping. Now, what does that mean to the actual picture? If I'm looking at a picture like this of this guy in the white shirt, if the contrast is set really high on the TV, I might be missing this top row and this whole entire second row and maybe this third row. So what does that mean to the picture? When I look at a picture of a guy in a white shirt like this, all these buttons and details and wrinkles, things that are in the shirt are completely blown out. I can't see any of it. This looks like one big white blob to me if this test pattern is clipped. So as we're adjusting the white level on the television or on the projector, at the end of the day, without getting too deep into it, we really want to see at least box number 235 here in the middle. And ideally, in a lot of situations, you go to see all the brighter boxes as well. But we want to see at least the bottom row and at least the second row. That would be ideal. We'll take a look at something similar with black level. This is the test pattern that we use to adjust the brightness or the black level of the TV. Now, in this case, I want to be able to see the top row, so 17 up to 26, but I don't want to see the bottom row, 6 to 15. So the bottom row should be invisible. The top row should be visible. And really, the general rule of thumb here, guys, is that I should see 17 and above. So there's a box here at 17. There's a rectangle here at 17. I should see that rectangle, that box, and the top row. Now, what does this mean to the actual picture? If I look at this image right now, at least on this monitor, I can see these bottom row of boxes right here. Now that means that the information that is, what is supposed to be black is 17. All the information below that is now visible. And what that means to the picture is, now the picture looks washed out. So if we look at this image, this black X right here is the same as level 15 right here. So in this image, I should only see one shade of black as the background. I should not see the X at all. I should have another shade of black that makes up the jacket, another shade of black that makes up the, the dress shirt underneath the jacket. So I should have one, two, three shades of black, not four, right? So if I go back to this test pattern and I turn the black level on the TV down, now these boxes disappear, but maybe I turned it down too low and now these boxes also disappear. Now when I look at an image like this, I've got all black here. I can't see any details or any difference between the jacket, the shirt, and the background. So I can turn the black level down too low. We call that crushing, and I don't see anything. You could turn the black level up, level up too high, and now the picture looks washed out, and things that are supposed to be black are now gray, and now the picture's ruined. Again, dynamic range is the most important part of the picture. So if the contrast and brightness are wrong, you're starting off on the wrong foot. You're not going to be able to get anything to look good if the, if the two basic things are, are not optimized. Next, we'll take a look at color saturation. Uh, here's a couple of test patterns that we use up on the screen, and here's a real world example I took this picture uh, years ago. So uh, what we've used in the past for many, many years are the Simpty color bars. And if you guys are on the webinar and you've been around for a while, uh, at least in the TV industry, or maybe you just remember as a kid, uh, these color bars used to play on the screen you know, late at night after the broadcast was over. And if you know what you were doing at home, uh, you could adjust you know, color and tint and brightness and contrast on your TV at home. What they were using this for was, you know, every night after the broadcast. Um, in a lot of cases, the, the broadcasters would be tuning their own monitors or uh, maybe white balancing the cameras or whatnot. So uh, these were tools that were being used both on the broadcast side. And if you knew what you were doing, you could, you could 
adjust your TV at home as well. We still use the Scentsy bars quite a bit. Still a very popular test pattern. Uh, over the years, uh, some companies have developed a uh, some some sort of simpler test patterns, if you will, non-technical, if you will. Uh, Portrait Displays made this test pattern, the test image, uh, back in like 2002 or three. Uh, we we have all the primary colors are represented, and all the secondary colors are represented in this test image. Plus, we have a grayscale in the background. So if you're looking at these empty bars, if you really know what you're looking for, you can adjust these by eye. Uh, if you're not quite that experienced, it's very easy to adjust this one by eye because we just watch the skin tones. If I crank the color up too high on the display, these people will start to look kind of orange. You'll lose some of the details and some of the wrinkles in the colors of the clothing and whatnot. So you can use the technical version or the non-technical version. Now, if I crank the color saturation up too high, this is what you end up with down here at the bottom. This is a picture I took, a screenshot I took from the movie Speed Racer. Uh, in this image on the left, that's with the color and the tint set correctly. Uh, nice, neutral, even skin tone. You can see the wrinkles and stuff in her shirt. If we look at the color cranked up too high, uh, the shirt turns this really weird kind of gross orange color. The wrinkles and details are all gone. And if you notice the color of her skin, uh, she looks like she's been out in the sun too long or something's going on there. It's really weird. Uh, what the camera didn't capture, what, what your eyes would capture, there's some detail here behind her hair next to her face that you could see when it was calibrated. You could not see when it was not calibrated. So uh, also some shadows back here under the trees, but really good scene to show off just a couple of things, get into shadow details and whatnot. But that's what happens, guys. If the color's too high, if the color's too low, she would look really pale and, and, and faded versus looking too, too colorful. We talked a little bit about color accuracy. Uh, I've got up on the screen right here, uh, the Kansas City Chiefs. I, I wanted to uh, give them a little shout out for that awesome Super Bowl they put on. But um, when you're, if you work in the world of print or graphic design, you know these these standards that we talk about in video. They're standards all over the place for all kinds of different things. Uh, if you're a marketing uh, team at, at the Kansas City Chiefs, you know for sure what color gold and, and what shade of red that those colors are that make up that logo. And whether you're in the print world or the graphic design world, there's these codes that we look at. So there's the hex color. The one that we're worried about in calibration world is uh, this RGB number. This RGB number is what we call a triplet. So the triplets represent the first number is red, the first number is green, the first number is blue. So if I mix these three colors together in this formula, that's going to give me that specific shade of red. Now the idea is I could use my signal generator to output that same exact triplet. And then when I measure the red that's coming off the screen, it should be the same red. That's kind of the whole point. And you can see it here too on this gold color. So the triplet for the Kansas City Chiefs gold, 255184E8. Now these are just 8 bit video levels. So if we look back at uh, the gold one here, 255 means that red is maxed out. 255 is the highest value for red. 184, so there's like about half intensity blue and 28 on green. So there's not much green in here. But again, if I, if I use this formula for RGB for this triplet, I'm going to get this shade of gold as well. Now, these colors can be manipulated and changed on the display based on how the display's white balance is set up. So if I have the display with a neutral white balance, the gold here and the gold once it's on the display here should look the same. Now, if the white balance on the screen is off, it's going to shift everything to a different color. So if you look at this example, the white balance in this image is correct. It's a nice neutral gray, uh, no discoloration at all. If we shift up to this middle example, the gray scale is too blue. And hopefully, depending on your monitor, you can see this. It's more of a bluish gray. If we go to the top example, that's more of a reddish gray. So the top example is too warm. The middle example is too cool. The bottom example is actually correct. So if I use this red and I show it on the screen, but that screen is too blue, that red and that blue are going to mix, and that red's going to look too purple, right? So that's kind of the idea. Everything should be neutral so that these colors look correct once they're made on this display. Here's an example I see, I took a picture of years ago. Um, this was the grayscale of a TV. Uh, at the time, this was a uh, first-gen LED backlit LCD TV. Uh, so we're talking like 2007 or eight or so. Uh, that you guys remember back in those days, uh, this was brand new technology. Everybody was very excited about it. Really, really expensive. So uh, if I remember correctly, this was like a 46 or a 52 inch flat panel. It was somewhere around five grand. Remember, this was brand new technology at the time. Now, after we, uh, after I adjusted the grayscale on the TV, 
you know, the hope is that you put up a grayscale test pattern, which is what you see on the left side of the screen here. So the grayscale test pattern is real simple. Uh, the left side is dark, and then we work uh, towards the neutral uh, middle gray, and then we work up towards white. So it's showing us all the shades of black and white from uh, dark to bright here. So the proper uh, proper grayscale, I should see all of the bars. They should all be uh, have some separation, and they should all be neutral as well. Now, if you look at this example on the right, this was the TV after the two-point white balance. So what the two-point white balance system does on a TV, it allows me to white balance the bright side of the grayscale and the dark side of the grayscale, kind of like adjusting bass and treble on a stereo. You have a low setting and a high setting. And the hope is after you adjust those two settings, it's nice and flat and you get gray. This was what really happened on this particular TV. So we adjusted the dark end, adjusted the bright end. The dark end was neutral at maybe one or two points. The bright end was neutral, maybe way at the top. But look what happened in the middle of the grayscale. Some pinks, some purples, even some greens in here. So this is a great argument, a great case for why you want to um, you know, buy a nicer TV and, and use some of these advanced, um, uh, advanced menu controls. If you have a customer who's really into video quality and accuracy and they like things to, to look correct, uh, I would have to either calibrate this TV more or if I couldn't work out some of these weird colors, uh, maybe this just isn't the right TV for this customer. Maybe, maybe we need to spend a little more money and get something that's a little more accurate. But uh, imagine what this would do to the picture, guys. So some of your levels would look okay. Some of your levels would look kind of purple. Some of your levels would look kind of green or kind of blue. This wreaks havoc to the picture. Uh, this is no good. So um, now the hope is that I can use a 10-point or 20-point white balance, and maybe I can adjust each one of these to get back to neutral. It's not always the case, but you have to look for those things. We talk about resolution and geometry. Uh, the test pattern that uh, is most commonly used right now, there's, a se there's several test patterns you can use for this. The most common one is what you see on the right. Uh, that's called the ISF geometry test pattern. Uh, a few things that we're going to look for here. Um, this, uh, this test pattern, if you look at the top, bottom, left, and right, it makes a big diamond shape. And I want to make sure that I can see the tips of the arrows right here, right here, right here, right here. Now, this doesn't always happen. In fact, rarely happens with a TV out of the box. A lot of TVs out of the box will be zoomed in, maybe 5% or so. So you end up chopping off the side, you end up chopping off a little bit of the bottom, you chop off a little bit of this side, you chop off a little bit of this side. So you might be asking yourself, why on earth, why? Why would they intentionally chop off the edges and the sides of the picture from the factory? They do it on purpose. If you guys have seen this before, this was a screenshot from the, I think, CBS football game. Uh, there's a black and white speckled kind of dotted line across the top here. We are not supposed to see that on our end at home on our TV. The broadcasters can see it. We're not supposed to. But, you know, they're humans and they're doing it live and sometimes there's mistakes. So if they don't want you to see this distortion across the top of the picture at home, the manufacturers will intentionally zoom the picture in a little bit. Because think about it. If you take a brand new TV home, you plug it in, you turn it on, and you've got this distortion around the top or around the edges, you might think something's wrong with it, you might return the TV. Just average Joe thinking right there. But if you turn off the overscan, I'm sorry, if you turn on the overscan, uh, the picture will zoom in a little bit, and now we're just seeing what's in this red area right here. Now, again, as I said before, if you zoom in on the picture even a little bit, it does make it less clear. So we want to make the picture as clear as possible. So we'll do things like turn off the overscan. Now, you're going to see this black and white speckle right across the top of the screen, but it's probably only going to be there for that specific show or that specific commercial. Uh, or maybe you turn the overscan off and on based on, you know, what the image looks like on, on the on the, um, on the broadcast end. Uh, now, the only thing that stinks about this is not only are we zooming in on the picture, making it a little bit less clear, but you see some things that happen on the edges. People get chopped off and things like that as well. So where you might be okay in some cases to use overscan for a football game, you would never, ever, ever want to use overscan for a, for a movie. Um, you know, we're going to zoom in too far. We're going to miss stuff on the side. We're going to make the movie a little blurry. So if you want to use the overscan for maybe your cable box or maybe that input, that's fine. I would certainly turn it off for any, any important sources like Blu-ray players and streaming devices. The other thing we look at for this test pattern is the sharpness, which you probably can't see because it's such a tiny little font here. Um, there's actually some numbers going left to right and top to bottom. And those, those numbers are actually counting pixels. So it starts at 0 to 1920, 0 to 1080. And every 10 or so pixels, there's a number. So like 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, all the way. So what I'm looking for here, you know, there's these little like hash marks 
that indicate the different pixels or what pixel you're at. Uh, the little lines that make up these hash marks should be nice and straight, nice and clear. When you turn the sharpness up too high on the TV, these little hash lines will have fake edges around them. We call that ringing, like a bell rings. So if you're looking at a test pattern, there's all this distortion in between all these little hash marks. And it looks really bad on the test pattern. But if you're looking at real world content, something like this, all of the edges around these letters and numbers and all the edges around all this text is going to be distorted and look really weird. Anything that has a round edge to it, like this C in control, is going to have a jagged edge around it instead of a nice smooth edge. So you can turn the sharpness up too high on the TV. It makes things look really bizarre. If you look at a close up of somebody's face where you should see, you know, eyelashes and pores and things like that, that's just all distorted. No good. So don't turn the sharpness up too high on the TV. That's a big misconception. So in order to do all this, what exactly uh, tools uh, did you need to actually do this? So it looks like a question came in. Let me take a second here. Uh, does the US, uh, does the UHD ISF geometry pattern have 30 or 40 by 2160? Chris, great question. And yes, it does. Uh, in the Meridio generator specifically, there is a uh, there's one page that has standard resolutions, uh, you know, 480 all the way up to 1080. There's even some basal resolutions in there as well. But then also on the Radio 60 generator, there's a dedicated 4K geometry resolution page uh, where you can pick specifically 4K, and then the patterns that are 4K natively in the generator will come out 4K. So as you look at this test pattern, where it might show 1920 by 1080, the 4K version of this test pattern will show 3040 by 2160. But you're still looking for the same things. It's a good question. Okay, so what tools are needed? Uh, first thing you'll see on the left side of the screen there, that's a Radio 6G generator. That's going to provide the test patterns up on the screen and, and allow us to calibrate the things we need to calibrate by eye and calibrate manually. The second thing we need is a light meter. Uh, those come in a lot of different varieties, a lot of different price points. I'll cover those a little more in length here pretty soon. Uh, a combination of the signal generator and the light meter, those are going to connect to a laptop. The laptop is going to run some software, and the software is going to help us dial in uh, some of the other controls on the TV that we cannot eyeball. So the white balance, the gamma, the color management, things that we need the light meter for. Uh, the software is going to give us all that data, and uh, and we're going to get through the calibration uh, in a quick and efficient, efficient manner. What I really like about the software, guys, is it's uh, it's set up as like a workflow. So uh, you know you have you know does a dozen or so steps you have to do to calibrate the TV. Um, the workflow is set up in such a way that you, know, you you do whatever you need to do on this page and you click next. You work on the next page, you click next. And it literally walks you through the process start to finish, which is super helpful. In the old days, we didn't have that. In the old days, we just had a piece of software with a target in it. So you had to remember what order to do things in, what to do first versus second. Oh, I can't do the, um, I have to make sure I remember to recheck the brightness and contrast at the end, even though I set it up at the beginning. Uh, so you just had to remember this stuff and you know, take, take a lot of notes and things like that. But the workflows have really, really helped uh, the process. Like another question may have come in. Oh, you just have a patient. Uh, this is a, a, a get Meridio uh, test pattern generator. This is called the 6G. Uh, it has a ton of ISF test patterns in there, uh, different things that you use to calibrate the display. Uh, this is HDMI 2.0, so it does 18 gigs uh, 4K with all flavors of HDR. Uh, so you can calibrate and analyze any version of HDR you'd like with this generator. You can also use this generator to read the heat of the TV, which is really helpful uh, for troubleshooting and, and getting things set up initially. Uh, it does have Dolby Vision built in as well, like I said, all versions of HDR. Uh, what's also cool about this piece is it is field updatable. Uh, we've got a couple of videos on YouTube and instructions on the radio website to update the firmware on the generator. If uh, if you don't have time to do the firmware update or maybe it seems intimidating for some reason, uh, I certainly understand that. Uh, feel free to let us know. We can uh, we can actually log in remotely and help you do that. So you don't have to send it in, which is kind of nice. Uh, this is our newest generator. This is called the 7G. Uh, this does everything the 6G does plus much, much more. Um, this is a HDMI 2.0 signal generator, but it also is capable of 2.1 uh, with a hardware upgrade that we'll be providing uh, this year for, for you guys who have this generator already. Uh, we can do things like testing ARC and eARC, which is really nice. We can do things like test input lag, which is very important these days, um, especially if you have somebody who's really into gaming and the input lag is super important for them. Or maybe you just have some device in the signal chain that's causing an error between the audio and the video and there's a lip sync problem. You can actually measure that with, it, with this new generator, which is super cool. Again, all versions of HDR are supported. Uh, there is USB 3.0 on it, so if you have any specific test patterns or, or test videos that you like personally, 
uh, you can feel free to upload those to the generator itself. It's got tons and tons of extra uh, storage space in there. And we left like several hundred gigs in there. So if you guys wanted to put some even 4K demo content in, so you can. Uh, all the files that are loaded on here are raw video files, so no conversion from 8 bit to 10 bit or anything like that, or no conversion from RGB to, uh, to YUV. It's all straight YUV. So less errors and more accuracy and things like that. Um, the test patterns that are built in, uh, the 6G has a bunch of ISF test patterns. The 7G has test patterns from ISF and many, many more as well. Uh, another uh, great organization out there is Professional Video Alliance. Uh, Greg Rowan, he's been instructing calibration for many years. He's got some great test patterns that are built into the generator. Uh, there's a company called, uh, or a disc out there called Spears and Munson. They're on the third version. Some excellent test patterns and demo material in that disc. So we included those test patterns as well. Sony Pictures has some specific test patterns, which are very valuable. We've got those built in. Uh, some from portrait displays, some from, uh, there's a gentleman named Bill Witzel who's been around for a long time making test patterns. So the guys, that the thing has thousands of test patterns in it from all different organizations. Uh, you'll never run out of test patterns here. And again, if you have some custom ones in mind or custom video clips that you want to use, you can upload and make a deal at all. Now, I do want to touch on the meters just a little bit. Uh, there are two different types of light meters out there that you use to calibrate the display. Uh, first thing we'll look at are tri-stimulus meters. Uh, these are the fastest uh, and typically the most cost-effective meters out there. Um, they, uh, they're, they're really known for how fast they are, but what they're not known for is how accurate they are. Uh, they don't quite see the light the way that our eyes see. They have to do some math and some conversions, and uh, it doesn't quite work out to be as accurate as, as other devices. But uh, what's really great about these is they can be profiled. So what that means is I can take a a high-end meter that's more accurate, but maybe not as fast, and I can pair it up with one of these tri-stimulus meters and um, make a profile. So I can go fast and it can be accurate at the same time. Now that does mean that you're lugging around two meters, uh, but it's not a big deal. They're not very big. Um, the, the nice thing about doing the profile is you're going to make the profile at the beginning of the calibration with your two meters. The more accurate meter is going to go back in its case, and you're going to actually use the faster meter for the rest of the calibration. So. Uh, you are using two meters, but really, at the end of the day, after you make a profile, you're just going to use one meter for the calibration. But again, it's just a, it's a matter of uh, measuring up the accuracy versus the speed. If you're doing a lot of this work, uh, speed, you know, speed will definitely matter. If you're maybe working on a studio, the studio has 40 monitors in it, you don't want to be there for six months calibrating, so uh, you want to use a faster meter for those types of situations. Um, there's lots of different software packages out there. Uh, the Radio 6G works natively with the Calman software by Portrait Displays. Uh, we also have a, a, another partner called Light Illusion. They have a, a great program called Lightspace. You know, both have their pros and cons. Um, there's a, a lot of folks out there who actually use both of these programs for different applications. Uh, but these are the, these are the two big ones. There's a couple other ones out there. There's even a free one out there. Uh, but these two work specifically with the radio generator out of the box. What I like about these two specifically is a lot of automation built in. So with certain displays, with Calman, for example, you can automate the, the calibration of the grayscale. Uh, with Light Illusion, you can automate lookup tables. You can do all kinds of cool stuff. These are both very, very good, very powerful software packages. Uh, they both come with reports. So uh, if you have a customer who likes to see the before and the after, uh, they, these two come with reports. I have some customers who are really into that stuff, so I'll put it in a little binder for them, and, and uh, they can keep it on the coffee table or whatnot. But the reports are cool. They have all the settings. They have the before and after performance. So you can really show the customer not only visually what changed in the TV, but also uh, on a graph and, and certain colors and whatnot, how far off they were versus how accurate they are. Now. The more accurate meters I mentioned before, uh, these are the kind of meters that you want to pair up with the tri stimulus meter. Um, a very, very popular combination right now is a meter by a company called X-Ray. This is their first generation uh, of their meter called the i1 Pro. Uh, they use one now called the i1 Pro 2, which is actually being retired, and they have an i1 Pro 3. Uh, that's a uh, that's a brand new meter for them. I actually have one here. Uh, where is it? Does it look? Well, maybe I need to see the other one. Okay, the i1 Pro 3 looks almost exactly like the i1 Pro 2. It does seem a little bit bigger. They open up the aperture on it a little bit more, so it, it should be a, a, a smidge faster, which is nice. But the difference is, guys, is that these meters. Uh, these are called spectroidiometers. You also see spectrophotometers. Uh, I, I like to say a lot of you know, spectral device. Uh, these meters are much more accurate than the tristimulus meters, but the trade off is they're much slower. So if I took something like an i1 Pro 2 and I profiled it to like maybe a C6, this little uh, portrait displays meter right here, the C6, 
for uh, less than about 2000 bucks for both meters. Um, I have very, very fast because the C6 is a quick little meter. And I have very accurate because I'm using an I1 Pro 2 to profile it, which is very, very good on accuracy. So there's a lot of different combinations and a lot of different meters you can use out there. Uh, as you get higher up in price, they're slower but more accurate. So if you look at something like this Minolta right here, uh, this is a lab tool. Uh, if you're reading a really, really dark level in the grayscale, uh, it could take two, three, four, I've heard six minutes before just to read one level versus that same level with the C6, maybe it's 10% gray, I can take that reading in like half a second or maybe one second. So if I, again, if I take a meter that's spectral and I pair it up with a meter that's tristimulus, I get fast and I get accurate. I can get my calibrations done quicker. And uh, because I profile with a spectral device, um, I can trust the readings are accurate and, and everything is good with that. Now, on the tristimulus meters, they do have profiles built in. So if I'm using something like this Klein or the C6, uh, when I'm in my calibration software, I can pick um, I can pick different profiles. Maybe there's a profile for OLED. Maybe there's a profile for uh, you know, projectors that are uh, with regular UHP bulbs. Uh, there's maybe a plasma, maybe an LED LCD profile in there. And those are typically good profiles, guys. But you don't know um, you know what brand TV they profiled to in the lab and how many hours were on it. And there's a lot of variables in there. So they will work to kind of get you by. But if you're doing more critical work, especially for studios, um, you're going to want to go with the two meter route. That's going to be really the best way to do it. Now, really, guys, at the end of the day, uh, I'll look at some graphs here, and I'll show you kind of the end goals for the calibration. Again, it's all about being accurate and, and matching the display to a known standard. So these are two screenshots from the report at the end of the calibration. What you're seeing on the left right here, uh, the pre and the post, this first graph is the RGB balance graph. So this kind of represents the grayscale. Now, if we look at the bottom, if you look at the x-axis here, you've got 10 to 100, so dark to bright. Zero would be black. So we're reading very, very, very dark gray all the way to peak white. Now, what should happen here is actually what's happening on the post calibration report. But red, green, and blue are very much separated from each other. Blue shoots way up here, red and green sh shoot way down here. So if I look at an image in this state, the gray scale is going to be very, very blue. It's going to shift everything towards blue. The end goal was to get red, green, and blue to match and to stay linear across the whole entire gray scale. So I go from way too blue, not enough red and green, to a nice tight grayscale right here. That's good. One other thing we're going to look at here is the gamma. Now, gamma gets a little tricky, but really, at the end of the day, it's a correction tool for the room lighting. If my room is really bright, I want to go with one gamma setting. If my room is really dark, I want to go with another gamma setting. The gamma setting is all about the room that you're in. Now, in this particular room, my target was this yellow line, but the TV was actually tracking from the factory way, way, way down here. Now, if I'm aiming for a gamma of, say, 2.2, it's really a 1.5. Again, without getting too deep into it, that means that the picture is way, way, way lighter and brighter than it should be. So my blacks are very gray. My whites are maybe too bright. It could be blown out in some cases. So this is no good. What I'm looking at over here is much better. I've got a much tighter grayscale. Colors are now way more accurate. And my gamma now is a lot closer to where it should be for this room. Now my blacks are a lot better, but because my brightness is set correctly and my gamma is set correctly for that room, my blacks are good and black, and I can still see shadows at the end of the day. Over here, the grayscale is way too blue, so the whole TV looks blue, and the TV looks washed out, and the blacks are very, very, very gray. So before and after on RGB balance and gamma, and the before and after on the color gamma. Again, same TV. Uh, we're aiming for a Rec 709 target, so we're aiming for these boxes for each color. Green's way oversaturated. Cyan's way too blue. White's way too blue. We knew that anyway. Magenta's too blue. Yellow's oversaturated and too green. And red's way oversaturated. This is going to cause the picture to look really, really cartoony. If we look over here on the right, everything's on target, which is excellent. This was an excellent calibration. I can't remember the TV on this one, but it turned out really good. This shows us our errors as far as saturation and hue for each color. This graph shows us our errors when it comes to luminance for each color. So at the end of the day, I'd want the targets to be on point, and I'd want the luminance errors to be minimized to zero. So we had some luminance errors here, but we got rid of those luminance errors after the calibration. The entire color, certain colors had really big delta errors. So as the cyan before had a delta error of 14. Uh, we want these numbers to be as low as possible. 14 means there's a visible error in cyan. 
And I can see why, because it's way too blue and it's oversaturated and it's a little bit too bright. So if we take the this chart and this chart, add those two errors together, we get a big error down here. After the calibration, if you look at cyan, the error is much lower because it's on target here and it's on target here on Lewis. So overall, massive improvements to cyan. Also big improvements to the other colors as well. So this is all good. This is all good. This looks fantastic. Luminance errors are down. Overall errors are down. This is what the report looks like at the end. Also with the report, guys, you're going to have the before and after when it comes to the settings. So a lot of cases when you're manually calibrating the TV, uh, you know, your brightness is set to this, your contrast is set to that, your gamma is set to this, your white balance levels are set to this, this, and this. Um, you know, God forbid one day if the customer accidentally resets the TV or there's some freaky thing that happens and they lose all their settings, that report's going to have all their settings in there and all the performance data in there as well. So you can email that to them, keep a copy of, uh, of it yourself on a PDF on your computer in case the customer ever loses it, and uh, everybody will be, uh, will be fine in case something like that happens. So with it for me, I talked about this before for, for installers and calibrators out there. Uh, it's recurring revenue. Um, we, uh, we also noticed that in the, a lot of times there's maintenance involved. Uh, if you're working in a studio environment, you know, those monitors need to be periodically calibrated. Uh, it doesn't hurt to do that on a TV in somebody's home either, but um, you know, it, it might be a little overkill in somebody's house to calibrate the TV every six months versus a studio where it's very, very common and, and in fact, in some cases, way less than six months. I know we have a calibrator who does CNN studios and they calibrate their monitors every like 300 hours after use. So probably, you know, once a week or, um, or something like that even maybe. Uh, I mentioned before, less returns. TVs that are calibrated, customers that are happy, uh, typically don't return those TVs. Um, and, uh, you know, a lot of this is word of mouth, too, guys. You'll get, um, you get a lot of customers who uh, they'll call you up or they'll ring you up and they'll say, hey, uh, my buddy had his TV calibrated. I have the same TV and this looks way better. Uh, can you come do mine? I get this a lot. Um, if you do take the ISF class, you are listed on the ISF website as an authorized dealer. So somebody could go in and they could type in you know, Texas, for example, and um, you know, type in a zip code even and find out, find you and find your company and, and get a hold of you that way. Uh, but you know, a lot, a lot of stuff in my own personal experience at least is, has been word of mouth and, and a lot of through online advertising. If you want to take a look now just to kind of test the waters, just go to imagingscience.com forward slash dealer, dealers and type in your zip code. That you kind of get an idea of, of all the companies around you or maybe the lack of companies around you that are calibrating. There might be some opportunities out there. As far as pricing goes, uh, for big box retail, um, I've seen anything from zero dollars for the calibration. Maybe they're doing a promo. You would know, buy a TV $9.99 or above and the calibration is free. I've seen those types of promos before. Uh, if they're doing no promo, the typical big box store, I usually see the calibration price at about $249. Um, if you're an integrator, I've seen a lot of integrators include the calibration in the price of the system. Um, so, you know, that labor is sort of just built in there somewhere. So the customer comes in and spends, you know, 20 grand, 50 grand, 100 grand on a home theater system. I see some integrators who just get calibrated as part of, of what they do. And I really do like that. And if it's an upsale, uh, maybe you decide to do it as, as a service as an upsale, or maybe uh, you want, you're, maybe you're okay with calibrating TVs that you didn't sell, potentially. Uh, I've seen individual integrators charge, you know, anything up to about a thousand bucks. A more complicated system. Maybe it's a really high-end projector with a Lumigen processor and a long signal chain of different components. Uh, and you're going to be there for a day or two. You know, you'll see up in the, like that maybe $9.99 range. Independent calibrators, uh, if you're thinking about doing this kind of on your own as a contractor, uh, I do see this a lot in some cases. Uh, like in my own personal case here in Florida, I do have a lot of dealers that um, they don't have the time or resources to go through class and to buy all the gear. So they'll just contract the calibrations out to me. I see that a lot, and then of course I have uh, individual, you know, private clients reach out, reach out to me, and, and they want me to do their system treatment as well. Independent calibrators, I've seen anywhere from 99 bucks to do some basic setup, some basic adjustments, up to again, you get in that 9.99 range. Uh, if it's a really complicated system that you're going to be there for for multiple days, I've even seen some calibrators charge a day rate. Uh, I did this once uh, last year, two years ago now. Um, there was a condo down in Miami that had like 14 TVs in it. So instead of charging per panel, I just charged them a day rate for each one of the days, and it kind of worked out better that way. Uh, so I had to drive down there and get a hotel and stuff for one night. So uh, the expenses were there, but uh, I charged just a flat day rate for two days, and it worked out really well. So uh, just a couple you know, ideas of pricing there for you guys. Uh, I'm a big fan of including it if you're calibrating or, I'm sorry, if you're selling and installing and building a big system for somebody. But you don't have to do that. You can do it as an upsell if you want to. Uh, but those are just kind of some general prices on, on what 
otherwise, you know, the field. So guys, that's really about it for me today. Uh, thanks for hanging out. Uh, thanks, Chris, for those questions. If you guys want any more resources from here, there's tons out there. Uh, ImagingScience.com. Uh, again, there's a lot of information here about the ISF. The, um, uh, if you go to ImagingScience.com forward slash dealers, that's where you'll get an idea of all the dealers in your area. Uh, more training classes we do. Uh, we do an ISF level one as part of the AV Pro Academy class. So AV Pro training will have some more information there. Uh, the radio.com, uh, we do have some forums. We're actually trans uh, we're actually working on those forums right now. We switched uh, we switched our web service around recently. So we're transferring all the old radio forums over to the new. So feel free to check those out pretty soon. They should be populated. And uh, I posted a lot of different tips on different TVs and stuff on those forums. Portrait.com, that's portrait displays. Uh, they're the folks who make the Calman software. They also have a lot of resources. Uh, how to uh, do auto cal on specific TVs and, and lots of cool tips and tricks on their website as well. Uh, Light Illusion, that's the other calibration software we talked about before. Lightillusion.com will give you an idea of what, uh, what Steam software is all about and, and all the great features that it, that it has to offer. If you guys have any specific questions for me, as always, Jason at avproglobal.com. Uh, any specific questions, do you want to take my brain on anything or if you're stuck on a job and need help with the TV? You know, my, my job with AV Pro Radio is training and support. So feel free to reach out to me if you guys have any support related questions. Other than that, thank you so much. Uh, we're just just over an hour right now. So thank you guys for hanging out. If you get any questions from here, uh, feel free to reach out to me directly. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and mute myself, but I'll leave the question box open for about another 30 seconds in case you guys have any additional questions. If not, thank you guys so much for attending, and uh, we'll see you on the next one.